Um, I'm Barbara Starr. I'm the owner of Terracotta Clothing Design, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm not used to speaking in front of people, so I'll, I'll try to stay engaging. Um, I was really excited when Robin called and asked if I'd be part of this because I am, as a small clothing designer in Canada, very passionate about sustainable, ethical um, production in sewing. Um, and um, I look forward to being part of the solution and having further discussion with the people I'm meeting today on being part of the solution. Um, this road that I'm on started a long time ago when I was being educated at UCLA, where I was getting my Bachelor's of Economics in the early 80s. Um, a very different time, I think we've touched on, that the 80s were a different time, and we weren't really thinking about ethical or sustainable. But through my studies of economics, something was wrong in the theory, the trickle-down theory that we were being taught, and the theory of more is better, and the theory that your business is good only as long as it's growing. And now I think we've reached the end of that and we need to come up with new economic solutions, especially in the garment industry, to solve these problems. Um, after a year after graduating, I was working for, I did my fashion simultaneously. While I was at UCLA, they had a two year program. And I did a year a term in the University of Washington where I studied textiles. Um, I. After graduating, I decided to open my own business. I was a little crazy. For anyone to open a small business with no experience, um, it's led me on a long, long road of learning, and hence wanting to teach other young designers that are leaving school and now being forced to start a small business because there are no opportunities for them otherwise. I am actually very passionate about mentoring them, helping them, imparting knowledge to them, and helping them rejuvenate a stronger, better garment industry in Canada. Um, I'll go back to the name of my company. My company is named Terracotta. I love hand-painted terracotta pottery. I collect some Italian pottery. It's been made since the 16th century. Same pattern painted over and over again by artisans with love and care. The same thing, sort of the way I approach my clothing line. I, the first season out, I hand painted every piece of garment, same pattern, same shirt, but each one done one by one. Don't do that anymore, but I still approach my clothing line with the same respect, and I approach my workers, my sewers, my cutters with that respect that they are handcrafting each garment one by one with love and care. Um, after six years of being in downtown Los Angeles doing the artsy fartsy thing, I met a man and fell in love and moved to Toronto. And I had a wonderful daughter who may or may not be here right now if she made it back in class. Um, and I decided to reopen my business. I'd worked in the industry for Alfred Sung Children's Wear for a while and I was ready to go on my own again. And started the new road in Canada and ended up where I am now. Uh, lots of bumps and grinds, I opened a store, I closed a store, I won some awards, I moved studios, I made lots of adjustments to adjust for being a mom, having a child, and wanting to accommodate that <coughs> lifestyle as well as being a young entrepreneur, a female entrepreneur, and a designer. Um, where that's brought me, it's brought me to a company, I still manufacture and design my own clothing, I do product development for other companies. Um, one, uh, Mick is a company that I do product development for. I do product development for cavalry vintage wedding dresses. All companies that somewhat have the same philosophy of me about making clothes with love and care and respect for those that do make the product. Um, I also hire out myself individually to these companies as a product manager. I will go to the sewing contractors, whether they're small contractors of one or two women and men, to larger factories of five, 50, 100 sewers, and I will manage their production. I will inter be the, their interface between their small company and their producers. Most of the smaller companies I deal with don't have the resources to have a full-time 
production manager. So I also actually get quite, there's a reward for me there because again, I want, for me, the health of the garment industry is dependent on the health of the players in the industry. If our young companies are going to interface with our existing sewers contractors and they don't speak the same language, we don't end up with a decent product. And I moved to Canada with the concept when I arrived here that Canadians produce the best garments in the world. And that was a perception coming from outside of Canada. That was a perception I had when I left Los Angeles that I was going to a place where we were very proud of what we made and we did the best we can. And I like to foster that feeling in the next generation. Um, one of my other pet projects that I'm really enjoying is I teach sewing. I teach sewing after work in my studio to those that want to learn. People came to me and said, oh, you sew, that's great. I want to know how to sew. And I said, okay, come on down. So I have a group of people that come to me somewhat regularly with projects in mind. And I walk them through the project from whether it's they want to make a pillow to I want to know how to make a jacket. They come, some of them come to me never seeing a sewing machine, some come to me with experience. But I facilitate their projects and I try to group them together with like-minded two or three people that might want to make a jacket or a dress or whatever it is they want to learn and facilitate their, their lust for sewing. This summer I was approached by a group of 20-something young ladies, four of them. They wanted to learn to alter their clothing. They came to me, we have four of us, we want to pay you this much, can you teach us? And they came for six weeks in the summer and brought their stacks of clothes, worked with each other, learned how to pin, alter. It was great. It was really, really rewarding. And it, through that, not only were these young ladies, they gained a new respect for what it took to make a garment. They came to me with the notion that a $20 blouse was expensive because $20 was tangible to them. But they left thinking, I can't believe how cheap that is. People should be getting paid much, much more for this craft, for this art. Um, one of the things that I bring to the table here today is conversations I have within the industry between the designers, the manufacturers, the consumers, the retailers and wholesalers that I talk to all the time about the industry. For me, I am very concerned about the I shouldn't say very, I am very concerned, but the thing that we talk a lot about is the labor force, because my interface between the designers and the contractors has to do with who's sewing, who's cutting, where are they coming from, and who will be doing this five and 10 years from now. The women that work for me that have 30 years experience are soon to retire. There is no one that's now five and 10 years younger than them waiting in line to take their jobs. Where are we going to be in five and 10 years as an industry, and not just a cottage industry, but a larger industry in Canada if we don't have a labor force? Um, the problem comes from we, don't, we do not educate a labor force of that nature. We don't, we, it's a very low paid industry. Um, recently when the minimum wage, a couple years went up, and. I was talking to one of the contractors and he said, we've just lost half our sewing team. When the minimum wage went up, they all went to the restaurant industry because they could make the same, now the wage in the restaurant industry came up to the wage in the sewing industry, they can now make the same money and get fed at the same time. So I think that we need to, excuse me, a little dry in the throat. <laughs> We need to nurture our current workers and retain them with a fair wage. This is something we all think that clothing, you know, that we, as craftsmen, we deserve a wage. But I also think that the people that work for us and sustain us in our sewers, our cutters, all of that also deserve that living wage. And we will then be able to sustain our industry with new workers coming in. Currently in Canada, we don't have an immigrant labor force coming in to replace 
the current labor force, because they're all an educated labor force. So we are coming to a point where we're going to rely on our own Canadians to fulfill those roles. And how we do that, <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, the other issue I have is our labor force also we need to find to make a plan as an industry how our labor force can afford its own product. I think this was brought up earlier as to how what where do we go with that? What where how do we plan an industry that isn't relying on growth? And I think that's part of the key of the industry. If the industry itself can afford itself, it's part of the cycle. If the people making product can afford the product, they're buying from each other and they turn over the dollars and it becomes a sustainable industry. If the people making product can't buy the product, it's a one-way street. And I think that is also something that needs to be talked about when we're talking about sustainability. It's not just is the fiber sustainable, but is the actual industry or the business model sustainable in the long run. Um, for me, that also comes with consumer education. I, most of my clients right now that I speak to are my individual clients, women that I dress, they're going out in the world and speaking to others. Because I don't get out of my studio a lot. When you work for yourself in a small business, you don't get out much. Um, and I have the conversation with them. When they come to me and they want to know why it's so expensive, I remind them it's still, it's 20 to 40% cheaper than it was what you were paying 10 years ago for the same thing. It's true, prices have gone down significantly. Um, and you're making twice the money, so it's actually quite a bit cheaper than what you paid for me 10 years ago. And I will actually be that frank. So it's not expensive. And you know fully well you're coming in here, you're buying a well-made garment, you're talking to the people that sew it, and it's going to be in your closet, at least for my company, it's going to be in your closet for the next five to 10 years because it's well-made. And whether, if it costs you $100 as opposed to $40, you're only buying it once. The, the $20 or $40 thing, you might be buying every year. So it's actually cheaper to buy the better made. And you can afford it. And we'll have that frank conversation. And in turn, they're turning around and talking to their friends about that conversation. Or at least I hope they are. Um, so for me, What's important to me and why I wanted to come here and talk like this and individually with other people is about how we change the culture of the industry, the culture of consumerism through conversations we have with our suppliers, with our customers, with our retailers, even with our employees and find and listen and find out what it is that's going to make the industry stronger and sustain the industry. And I'm hoping that all of you young people that are joining the industry are able to participate in that conversation and make a difference, because it's going to take the next generation to do that. Thank you.